In today's emotionally charged, incisive, and yet also somehow oddly mechanically erotic episode of whatever TF this actually is, I'm going to move this giant 140 kilo horizontal metal cutting bandsaw from here in the baby fat cave over to Cletus Van Dam's grown up fat cave just a few k's away. That's right, I've had my visa stamped and he's letting me in. So that's something to look forward to. And I'm not doing this because it's a compelling visual spectacle. Like, dude, it's not. The reason I'm doing this is because you might be faced with a similar challenge one day of moving something really, really heavy. And I'd like to share with you some of the things I learned as a young engineer in industry, being told in no uncertain terms to get that out of the way by various crane chasers in factories. So we're going to do this so that you don't wake up one day with a perplexed look on your face in the emergency department and you don't damage anything costing you hundreds or even thousands of dollars en route. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au, new cars, cheap, Australia-only website card. Now, normally I would do such a thing with a chain block. I've got these two beams in the ceiling and really this is for you if you've got a shed or a garage with head clearance like this and beams above holding the roof above off your head down here, okay? Even if you've got the head clearance, you can get around not having a beam with an A-frame of sorts. I'll put a picture up on the screen somewhere to show you the kind of jigger I'm talking about there. And in fact, that's what my alter ego Cletus uses in the other fat cave because it's a reinforced concrete structure and no real beams in the ceiling to conveniently latch onto. I've partnered with Vivor today for this DIY segment and they've sent me these products for demonstration and evaluation. The first one is this 500 kilo, well I guess it's a hoist if you use it this way, but it would be a winch if you use it this way and it's compatible with use in either direction. So basically you get 500 kilos of pulling power or lifting power depending on how you orient the thing. It's got hooks at either end rated with a working load limit of one ton. On the business end here of the wire rope you've got quite a large hook which is compatible with you know, several slings or whatever you need for rigging purposes, it's always nice to have a bit of real estate here for that. It's got an on-off switch. I'd be leaving that basically perpetually on and I'd use a general purpose outlet like a PowerPoint to turn the unit on or off if it's three meters overhead perpetually. And a port here for a screw-in lockdown port for a wired remote control, which is essentially so simple that even the Prime Minister of Australia would be able to use it, like with the correct training and proper diet, anything's possible, I suppose. A backbencher though, no problem. So you will be able to use it without referring to the instruction manual. It's got a limit switch here. It's got a little green limit switch that stops you sucking the hook right into the body of the machine, which would be the lifting equivalent of dogs and cats living together. Nobody wants that. The other thing we're using today is this crane scale. Now, a crane scale is really useful if you're not exactly sure how heavy the thing is that you're lifting. You can put this in between your hoist and your thing of unknown mass and just lift it up this far and see what the reading is. Let's say you're a tradie you've got a two-ton ATM trailer and it weighs 400 kilos tear so you've got 1600 kilos of lifting capacity payload capacity in the trailer then you've got 10 things to move and you don't know how much they weigh if you lifted them up with this hoist with this crane scale in between just to check each one you could note down the mass and make sure that you didn't overload your trailer you could say the same thing about caravanners putting everything including the kitchen sink into their caravans and really not knowing how much any of that stuff weighs a crane scale is really useful now the other thing all these scales work the same way but they've got a tear function as well so that if you are holding something in a steel bucket 
and you don't really want to know the mass of the bucket. You just hit the tear button with the bucket hanging there empty and it'll zero the scale so that the mass of the bucket is not included in the mass of whatever it is you weigh. So that's quite well thought out. Three AA batteries to power this jigger and uh, just keep it somewhere where you don't drop all the heavy chains and that on it. It should work just fine. I'm also going to be using, uh, this is not a Vivor product per se, but Vivor does sell them. This is a clamp for a girder and there's a girder trolley up there as well. And I think Vivor sells both of them as well. So if I can find links to them, I will find them and put them all in the description if you want to uh, kit yourself up for this kind of thing. If you're a four wheel driver, you'll already have shackles and you'll need some slings as well if you want to do this safely and half professionally. But anyway, links in the description for the Vivor stuff and I'd like to thank them for supporting this episode. I guess the first bridge to cross here is if you're going to do a similar thing, then is it going to cause the floor to collapse when you do this? And I'm not going to be a structural engineer for free for you to assess your particular situation, but here's how I think about this, okay? These steel beams are really holding the floor up just above in the main living space of my house. So I would have no problem putting 10 people up there just standing around having drinks. Not that I'm that freaking gregarious, but in a parallel universe, gregarious me would do that without an issue. Okay, so all good, dude. 10 people, what, even if they're fairly slim people, that's going to be six or 700 kilos, is it not? And I wouldn't have any worry about the floor collapsing with taking them with it down into this place. So that means I'm going to limit myself to 500 kilos maximum hanging off one of these beams at any particular time. Just skipping forward briefly here, you can see the crane scale in action. It's telling me that the saw weighs just under 140 kilos. So I'm confident that those beams will hold that all day long without any risk of imminent collapse. One of the redeeming features of using the cheese of steel, like low carbon steel for structural beams and things of that nature, is that they are fairly tolerant to bending. They don't fail without warning, in other words. You see them bend, right? And if you see a significant bend in anything that's really not supposed to be bending like that, that's nature reaching out. It's like science reaching out and grabbing you by the lapels and saying, hey, dude, back off now, imminently to collapse. So if you wanted to assess that in practice, you could use your crane scale, you could get something that weighed 100 kilos or whatever, and you could hoist it, you know, this far off the deck with the crane scale there. So you measure it, you say, yeah, that's 100 kilos, and you put it in the center of the beam, you could run a string line across the beam and you could see how much it actually deflects. And if it's only like bees endophallus, then you're okay, dude. That's not advice. It's just something that you could do for the sake of interest. Okay, so getting up there, right? Because I've got these two chain blocks up there. You've got to get up there and you've got to anchor the job to something. You've got to anchor the hoist to something. So I'm replacing that chain block just there with this hoist. And obviously it goes this way. So I've got to get this hook over something and I'm going to put it on the crane trolley, like I've got a girder trolley that just rolls along the beam. So that gives me the ability to position the girder laterally across the fat cave, right? And that means I can either carry the chain block down or I can hang the chain block on something else temporarily while I'm using the hoist, which is really light actually. It feels like it only weighs 12 or 15 kilos or something. It might be slightly heavier than that, but it's actually compact and light. And you can use it horizontally as well with the, with the buttons. So if you needed to drag something hypothetically, you could do that as well. The lift capacity of this is 500 kilos, by the way. Although the hooks have uh, one ton working load limits on them. So they're kind of overkill for that application. But there's plenty of real estate, particularly on the one connected to the load. So what am I going to use to hold the chain block? Answer one of these. This is the simplest thing to attach a lifting device to if you've got a beam, like a girder. 
This is a one size fits all proposition. It's rated at one ton. So comfortably overkill in the context of 500 kilos of lift capacity if you wanted to use one of these. And obviously the flange just goes in here. The bottom flange of the beam locates in here and you just clamp it up to your particular beam. The thing that is less than ideal about using this for a lifting point is that your lifting point can't slide along the beam. So I tend to use this for things like, I've got a big punching bag just over here, and I hang it from the beam on one of these because I don't want the punching bag backwards and forwards. I just want it hanging there so that it can suck out my soul and leave me devoid of the will to live like a withered husk because that's what punching bags are for after all. I'm going to get up the ladder then we're going to fit this, hang the chain block on this, put the hoist on the girder trolley and then get cracking. Which brings me to my next central overarching thesis about getting four and a half meters up in the air. So you've got to assess yourself. If you're getting older in particular you've got to say to yourself Am I capable of doing this? And am I capable of doing this safely? And it's got to be a no shit assessment, dude. And if you're not capable of doing it, then get someone who is. Because waking up in hospital, not being able to feel your legs, that's unacceptable, you know? So you've really got to do this no shit assessment of your own ability. If you've been doing this sort of thing a lot and you're still in reasonably good shape and you work out, then that probably is going to be okay. If you are going to get up a ladder and you're going to get higher than your own standing height at all, then do what I do, which is put your brain in a box. It's really important to put your brain in a box because if you fall down, one of the biggest problems is a head injury, okay? And having your brain, it can't hurt if you put your brain in a box like a bicycle helmet. So I always wear a helmet, not a hard hat either. Like the purpose of a hard hat in construction is to stop projectiles coming through, right? Like someone drops a rivet from the deck of the Harbour Bridge. Hopefully the hard shell, if you're, you know, three metres below or four metres below, it's going to deflect the rivet without it, you know, putting a big dent in your cranium. This is more like shock absorption. There's a little bit of a hard shell on the outside of your average bicycle helmet, but the, but the miraculous protection is really the particular grade of pretty dense foam in here which is designed to sacrifice itself before you get a brain injury, right? So you can think that's overkill if you want, but I can assure you it is not. And having a brain injury is typically forever. You don't want that. The other thing I'd suggest is every time you get up a ladder, wear safety specs. And that is counterintuitive as well. But I'd suggest to you that the optic nerve is part of your central nervous system. So if you get an eye injury, like even a minor eye injury, a bit of a scrape over your cornea, something like that, then if it's hard enough, if it's just a hard enough hit, the lights will go out. The server room will reboot and you will fall to the ground without any of the biological protection wired in up here to save your brain. When you fall, your arms won't come out because you will be rebooting. Ask me how I fucking know. <laughs> I've had that conversation in agony with an ophthalmic surgeon. I said, I don't even remember the fall. And he said, well, you're probably unconscious. And I said, what do you mean unconscious? I didn't get hit that hard. It was, you know, a branch hit me in the eye. And he said, eh, optic nerve, part of your central nervous system, dude, happens all the time. So you've been warned, it's up to you. Get up the ladder without any of that stuff. If you want, that's on you. At this point, let's say you've got your girder trolley or your girder clamp installed and you're ready to rip with your hoist, okay? I'd be thinking well and truly about how exactly I'm gonna do that before I get up there, okay? Because with this installation in particular, with the clamp, I can't get the hook over the clamp. It'll fit on the girder trolley, no problem, because that's more of a piece of uh, laser cut plate and it just slips straight over. But if you're dealing with this kind of installation, I'd suggest getting up there with a piece of rope so that you can hang this off here and take the load off literally while you're up there. And do this discovery on the ground, dude. 
Don't do search and discovery of this nature up the top of a ladder. Test fit everything first on the ground before you get up there. And if this won't fit over this mounting pin here, come up with a viable, safe solution, which would be a, in this case, 3.2 ton shackle. That's the one with the 19 mil pin, I think. Common in four wheel drive recovery, it's exactly the same thing. So what I would do is I would fit my shackle to my clamp preemptively. I'd install the clamp up there. Then I'd put a piece of rope on here so that I could easily just hang this off that when I'm up there. That's gonna take the load off, literally, just for installation purposes. And then I can crank it up with the rope and hold it in position so that I'm not lifting something really, really heavy and needing both hands to manipulate a shackle. And that's gonna be in position, held by a rope, and I just have to get the pin through the shackle. And if it's gonna be up there for a while, I'd suggest wiring the pin to the body of the shackle so that it doesn't incrementally undo itself and then just collapse without warning one day on your head, because that would be bad, okay? But in this case, I didn't have to do any of that because the girder trolley, which is just a piece of um, laser cut plate, the hook on the top of the hoist fits straight over, so that was easy to install. I'm just covering this particular, you know, alternative installation off if you decide you're gonna use a clamp on the girder instead of a trolley. All right, so another point I'd make here is like gloves or not with all of this stuff, okay? Now, to me, gloves are a kind of last resort for a lot of things because they also are an entrapment hazard for a lot of machinery and equipment. It's easy to get pinched and dragged into something. And I guess if you've got office workers' hands, then you do need gloves for protection from superficial kind of injury blisters and things of that nature from time to time. I tend to do a lot of pull-ups and kettlebells and things of that nature, so my hands uh, don't suffer from that problem. But if, if yours do, you just have to bear in mind that getting up a ladder with gloves, for example, might be a bad idea because it will affect your ability to engage for your own safety with a grip on the ladder or something of that nature if you know you get disoriented or you've got to grab something in a hurry I'd rather be doing that barehanded than with gloves you shouldn't get in that situation the other thing about ladders and I know this is jumping all over the place a little bit is don't get outside the rails with your hips so think about the extent of where the belt buckle is not a bad trick, okay? If your belt buckle stays inside the rails of the ladder, it's extremely hard to overbalance the ladder if you find yourself reaching out here or reaching out here. Just think about that belt buckle and keep it in between these rails, and that's not a bad way of ensuring that you don't <laughs> sail off sideways, which, trust me, you don't want to do. So let's talk about getting a machine ready to move. There are some things that are just in the way, okay? In particular, like there's an end stop, like a stop block thing on a bandsaw, and it's gotta go because a bar of that nature just hanging out there in space, if it nudges something on the way to the ute or off the ute or being installed, it could break the casting. Not so bad if it just bends itself, but if it breaks the casting, then that's kind of a detailed repair. You'd have to braze that. So much easier just to remove anything that's easy to remove that could potentially be a source of damage to a vehicle or a source of damage to the machine itself. There's a coolant tank in the bandsaw as well, so I've just plugged that at the top with a rag so that if there's some sloshing backwards and forwards, it doesn't just lose the coolant everywhere in the bed of the ute. And there's also a transport. Oh, damn it. I should kill something every day just for operational proficiency, and that was a perfect opportunity by that much, dude. 
there's a transport lock on the bandsaw, right? So it's just a piece of metal that you lock into place in between the body and the, and the pivoting arm. And it's a good idea to do that as well, just in case. And basically then the machine is kind of good to go. Now it doesn't have lifting points per se, so you're gonna have to figure out a decent way to rig it for lifting. And in this case, what I did here was I used proper slings, right? Because jury rigging a piece of rope or something of that nature, that's for the birds. Load rated slings are cheap, effective, durable, and safe. So they come in a few different varieties. They come in lengths, actually. This is a one meter, one ton sling. And the reason they look funny, like they look sort of bunched up in places, is because there's two different components. The outside of a sling is just a protective sheath. It doesn't actually carry the load. What carries the load is inside this tubular protective condom, right? So there's those two things. Now, this is a one ton by one meter. It's the length of the sling like that. It's not one meter in total, in case you're wondering when you're looking online in the catalog. This is two tons by two meters. They're the ones I'm actually using on the saw. And just in case I have to lift something bigger, this is uh, two tons by three meters. It just wraps around something with a bigger belly, basically. But these are nice, safe things to use. In general, it's better if you use slings like this and go straight over the hook, you know. But in this case, I couldn't go straight over the hook because I had four of these ends and they're a bit beefier. So I used a 4.7 ton shackle, just the same as a four wheel drive recovery shackle. That's the one with a 22 millimeter pin, I think. It's in that ballpark. Anyway, just the bow just gives you more real estate for numerous thicknesses of webbing, which is exactly what I did in this case. There's an alternative way you can rig stuff. You can obviously do this if you have to in some cases, but I'd suggest that if you're lifting something heavy, you should never do it this way because the stresses here are not as well distributed as if you did the lift like that. Okay, so in general, lift stuff like that with your crane or whatever you're using. The hoist itself now, really easy to use, like the hoist only functions when you are pressing the button, okay? As soon as you take your hand off, it stops. Although I would say, this is a pretty powerful electric motor, it's 1500 watts and there's obviously a gearbox in there as well because the drum turns fairly slowly, as you'd expect with a device of this nature. So there's a fair bit of rotational momentum, like angular momentum. When you take your finger off the button, the motor and gearbox turn for a while and the cable continues to move. So you find yourself after a while anticipating the stop and lifting off a little early. In both cases, up or down. You want it to stop at a particular height, lift off early and it'll go up a little bit. And same thing on the way down. I'd suggest that the big advantage of this compared with a chain block is elbow grease, right? Because if the hook is way up here and you need the hook way down here to lift something, there's a lot of just mindless cranking on that chain to drive the chain down to engage the hook with whatever you need to lift. And likewise, if you lifted something up there and you brought it across here, now you need to get the hook all the way down here, then there's a hell of a lot of Good for the soul, I suppose. Whereas with this, you just hold a button and the hook just moves and it's much more convenient. The advantage of using a chain block though is when you're positioning something precisely, if you want to really just inch it a little bit, nudge it, you get very good precise control with a chain block. Whereas with something like this, you hit the button and it moves quite a bit. Okay, so you don't get that real fine precision control that you get with a chain block, but the price you pay with the chain block is just that mindless cranking over and over just to get the hook through a gross movement to start doing work with it, right? So they'd be the two uh, differences. Obviously greater capacity with a chain block as well, but I would be able to count on one hand the number of times I've ever moved anything here greater than 250 kilos, you know, so uh, for my lifting requirements, 500 is overkill and this functions just fine. 
you'd have to come up with a solution for the cable, which would obviously be you engage the cable. It's a screw type fitting for the cable, so it's well connected, but I would, just to take the pressure off the end of the cable, I'd cable tie it and the excess to the handle while it's up there, and I'd make sure the remote was hanging at about, I don't know, this kind of in-between elbow and shoulder height, kind of ambient height in the workshop, and obviously on a girder, you can roll it backwards and forwards so that when it's not in use, which it wouldn't be most of the time, you can just clip the remote to some convenient part of the wall so it's not just in the way and vulnerable to damage. When you are lifting anything heavy, here's, this should be so obvious, but I'm just gonna state it anyway explicitly. Don't get under it. Don't get under it even a bit. Get out of the way all the time. This is like rule number one for being in a workshop environment where there is a crane. Whatever is being lifted, don't get under it. Don't get completely under it, don't get your leg under it, don't get your fingers under it. So many nerve endings in the human hand, dude. Like, don't get your fingers under it. Just don't get under it even that much, okay? Just keep away from the path of it falling. Gravity is gonna cause it to fall straight down if something fails and you don't want to be in the line of fire. So don't do that. Use the remote, step back from the thing, guide it from on top. It's easy to swing things around and rotate them. So you can see here, all I'm basically doing is I'm getting it up high enough to reverse the ute in and I'm basically checking a few times on the way in because it is a pretty tight space and I don't want to hit anything, obviously, and I want to make sure the saw is in exactly the right position just to lower onto the bed of the ute and then drive off. And lowering it down, like I'm not getting under it. I'm getting close in a couple of places, but I'm not getting under it. So it all went into the bed of the ute really safely. And then I just put a, I think it's a two and a half ton, might be 1500 kilos, I can't remember. But anyway, an overkill ratchet strap that just held the saw in place for the brief trip over to Cletus's joint. So I'll have links to all this stuff in the description if you want to tool up for anything of that nature. If you are the slightest bit uncertain about what those beams overhead will hold, don't just look at it and go, oh, she'll be right. Get someone who knows what they're talking about to come and have a bit of a look and give you at least some professional guidance. I just know that those beams are going to be fine because of the work that they are already doing and I had a careful look at it with my engineer's hat on, so that was a rare advantage to actually being awake in some of those mind-numbing lectures. So there's that. More than anything else, though, I'd really like you to be safe when you do this stuff, you know, because everything from ladders to lifting heavy stuff has just got these pathways to failure, and by failure, it means waking up in the emergency department and you know, I don't want you to do that. You can have fun in your fat cave, you can move heavy shit. It's odd, oddly satisfying when you do things of that nature, but you've got to be cognizant of the risks and you've got to have a 100% success rate because it's not okay, 99% is a fail because you're going to end up doing it 100 times, right? And it only takes one time to fall off a ladder, like it does. It only takes one time to drop a 150K saw on your leg and smash your knee and give an orthopedic surgeon a real challenge for that day. He's gonna get the opportunity to do his best work anyway. You don't have to give him this free kick. It's That's not on you, dude, you know what I mean? So just have a think about what you're doing and if you're unsure about how to rig things up, like just get it off the deck an inch or so and nudge it a little bit to the side, make sure it's nice and stable before you get it way up here. Because way up here, you're at risk of getting under it in a big way and that could be a disaster. So I suggest minimizing the time that something's way up here, maximizing the time that it's really close to where you want to install it, like just this far off the deck. and. As long as you think about that and you're not in a hurry, you'll probably be okay. Thanks for watching.